Welcome everyone to today's session. Today we will be discussing about the Barrett's esophagus, a condition that requires early diagnosis and effective management. In this concise video, we will get to know what is Barrett's esophagus, we will see why and how it develops, its causes and complications, its signs and symptoms, diagnostic techniques and the treatment options. And to know all of this, you have to watch the video till the end. So, let us get started. First of all, what is Barrett's esophagus? Barrett's esophagus is a condition where the normal lining epithelium of the esophagus is replaced by the intestinal epithelium. This condition is also known as intestinal metaplasia within esophageal mucosa. Here we can see this is the esophagus and um, below we have the stomach and then the intestine. The esophagus is lined by the squamous epithelium and the intestine here is lined by columnar cells. Additionally, there are some goblet cells in the intestine. This is very important. Now, if the lining epithelium of the esophagus changes from the squamous to the columnar epithelium with goblet cells just like the intestine then this condition is known as the intestinal metaplasia within esophageal mucosa that means the squamous cells of the esophageal mucosa have transformed into intestinal epithelium and this cellular transformation from one type to another type is known as metaplasia. So there is intestinal metaplasia within esophageal mucosa. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Now let us see why this transformation happens. This transformation of the epithelium is primarily due to chronic exposure to stomach acid and is often associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease aka GERD. Let us see the whole process. This is of course the esophagus, then the stomach and the intestine. We can see the esophagus is lined by the squamous epithelium and the intestine is lined by the columnar cells and we can also see the goblet cells here. The stomach secretes acid and ultimately the acidic contents of the stomach reach the intestine but that acid cannot harm the intestine because this acid is neutralized by the mucin in this region which is region bicarbonate and this mucin is secreted by the goblet cells that is why the acid of the stomach cannot harm the intestinal mucosa goblet cells play a crucial role here by secreting alkaline mucin which neutralizes the acid and normally the acidic contents of the stomach cannot go back into the esophagus due to presence of the lower esophageal sphincter but if somehow the acidic gastric contents are refluxed into the esophagus like gastroesophageal reflux disease then the epithelium of this region easily gets injured because the epithelium in this region do not have a protective mechanism to neutralize the acid so they easily get burnt by the acid now to survive in this condition the cells of this region change themselves like the intestinal cells as we know that uh, they can neutralize acid and have the capability of surviving in this condition that is why the squamous epithelium of the esophagus changes into the columnar epithelium containing the goblet cells like the intestine the goblet cells secret the alkaline mucin to protect this area from the acid burn. So we can say that this is actually an adoptive phenomena. This is how the Barrett's esophagus develops. Let us explore the causes now. Barrett's esophagus is primarily caused by chronic and untreated GERD. We have seen how the GERD may lead to Barrett's esophagus. Now let us see what causes more acid reflux and uh, that may ultimately lead to Barrett's esophagus. Number one cause is weakened lower esophageal sphincter. Normally, the lower esophageal sphincter prevents the reflux of the acid from the stomach into the esophagus. But when it is weakened, 
then the stomach acid can easily be refluxed back into the esophagus. In chronic condition, irritation by the acid can ultimately lead to Barrett's esophagus. Smoking weakens the lower esophageal sphincter, thereby increases the risk of Barrett's esophagus. Also, the hiatal hernia. This is a condition where the portion of the stomach protrudes into the chest through the diaphragm. It can significantly contribute to GERD and thus increases the risk of Barrett's esophagus. I have a detailed video on hiatal hernia where I have explained how hiatal hernia may lead to GERD and how to treat this condition. You can click the link on the top of the right corner of the screen if you want to know about the hiatal hernia. Then obesity is also a factor. Excess weight can increase the abdominal pressure leading to more frequent episodes of acid reflux. Increased acid production is also a cause. Smoking, certain medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, I mean new sites, and also the poor diet like um, consuming a diet high in fatty foods, acidic foods, caffeine, then alcohol may lead to increased acid production and thus exacerbate GERD symptoms and contribute to the development of the Barrett's esophagus. Then the genetics. The role of genetics in Barrett's esophagus is not fully understood. There may be a genetic predisposition for some individuals to develop this condition. Overall, Barrett's esophagus typically develops over many years of chronic acid reflux. Okay, uh, now let us discuss the potential risks and complications associated with the Barrett's esophagus. Number one is dysplasia. Barrett's esophagus may progress to dysplasia. See the abnormal cellular changes in the lining of the esophagus and it increases the risk of the cancer. Remember the metaplasia in the lining epithelium of the esophagus? We all know what metaplasia is. This is a condition where one type of normal matured cell is converted into another type of matured cell. It happens in response to chronic irritation, inflammation or injury, just an adaptive change. But dysplasia on the other hand refers to abnormal cellular changes like um, having the abnormal cellular architecture or cellular disorganization, then um, abnormal growth patterns, etc. It is considered as a precancerous condition. That means it has a chance of turning into the cancer. So you may see dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. Then also the esophageal adenocarcinoma. After the dysplasia, Barrett's esophagus significantly increases the risk of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma, that is the cancer of the glandular cells of the esophagus. Then uh, esophageal stricture, scar tissue may be formed here due to chronic inflammation and can lead to narrowing of the esophagus, known as the esophageal stricture, ultimately causing difficulty in swallowing. Uh, Barrett's ulcer can also develop. Inflammation and irritation of the esophageal lining by the acid may lead to formation of the ulcers, increasing the discomfort and complications. These are known as the Barrett's ulcer. Ulcers in Barrett's esophagus can lead to bleeding, potentially recurring medical intervention. Then let us see what are the signs and symptoms. Barrett's esophagus itself often does not cause any symptoms. However, Individuals with Barrett's esophagus may experience the symptoms related to the GERD. I highly recommend watching our previous video on GERD for detailed insights. However, common symptoms are heartburn, a burning sensation or discomfort in the chest, usually after eating or when lying down, then regurgitation, sour or bitter tasting fluid coming back into the mouth or throat, especially when bending over or lying down. Dysphagia, that means difficulty in swallowing, which may feel like the food is sticking in the throat or in the chest. And this happens due to the formation of the esophageal stricture. Then odynophagia or painful swelling may also be experienced by some of the patients for Barrett's ulceration. Sore throat, it happens due to irritation of the throat by the stomach acid. 
then in some cases you will see the hoarseness of the voice and uh, this is also due to irritation of the throat by the stomach acid then a uh, chronic cough in some patients a persistent cough particularly at night often due to stomach acid irritating the throat again and also when the acid is reflexed and enters into the respiratory tract unexplained weight loss in some cases though this is less common but uh, when the patient has difficulty in swallowing then it might happen so these are actually the common symptoms of GERD that may be experienced by the individuals with the Barrett's esophagus uh, the diagnosis of the Barrett's esophagus typically involves the following steps number one is upper GI endoscopy a flexible tube with a camera is passed through the mouth into the esophagus to visualize the mucosa here we will look for characteristic changes of the particular region. In this case we will find red velvety mucosa which is a visual indication of a mucosal inflammation and vascular congestion. And above we have the normal pale mucosa of the esophagus. So this is the red velvety mucosa, I mean the affected region and this is the normal pale mucosa of the normal portion of the esophagus. And then the biopsy. During the endoscopy, tissue samples are taken from these regions. These biopsies are then examined under a microscope by a pathologist. Microscopic findings of Barrett's esophagus typically include intestinal metaplasia, the replacement of normal squamous epithelium of the esophagus with columnar epithelium, and we will also find many goblet cells resembling the lining of the intestine. This is the hallmark histological feature of Barrett's esophagus. Here, this is a microscopic view of the Barrett's esophagus. You can clearly see the metaplasia here. These are the columnar cells and you can see the nucleuses clearly. And there are abundant goblet cells here. They secret the mucin which um, can neutralize the acid. These all are the microscopic views of intestinal metaplasia where the goblet cells are visible. We'll also find the inflammatory infiltrates. Inflammatory cells may be present in the lamina propria of the esophagus and it reflects the ongoing tissue damage and repair process and uh, the chronic inflammation. We may find dysplasia in some cases. In cases of advanced Barrett's esophagus, dysplastic changes may be observed microscopically. The cells may show irregular cellular architecture, nuclear enlargement, hyperchromatia that means increased the staining intensity of the nucleus, loss of normal cell polarity, etc. These cases may progress to cancer if left untreated. Here we can see the cells have lost their normal cellular architecture. These are the dysplastic change. So these are the microscopic changes. In some cases, additional tests like the uh, imaging studies, for example, the perium swallow, then CT scan, or the specialist endoscopic techniques like the chemoendoscopy, narrowband imaging, may be performed to further evaluate the extent of Barrett's esophagus or to assess for complications such as the strictures or nodules. Now, let us explore the available treatment options for Barrett's esophagus. Number one treatment option is lifestyle modification. Lifestyle changes can help to alleviate the symptoms of GERD and thus reduce the risk of Barrett's esophagus progression. These include dietary modification, avoiding triggering foods such as spicy, acidic and fatty foods. And it's better to eat in a small quantity but have more frequent meals then um, quit smoking and alcohol then um, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight can reduce the pressure on the stomach and lower the risk of acid reflux also sleeping with the head raised can help to prevent stomach acid from refluxing into the esophagus during the sleep number two is uh, medication pharmacological therapy may be prescribed to reduce the acid reflux and inflammation in the esophagus common medications include proton pump inhibitors i mean ppis then h2 receptor antagonist or the histamine 2 receptor antagonist then the antacids i have already described how they work in my previous video then third number option is the endoscopic therapy endoscopic treatments may be recommended for patients with Barrett's esophagus who have uh, dysplasia or precancerous changes these procedures remove the abnormal tissue and reduce the risk of cancer development endoscopic therapies include 
Radio Frequency Ablation This procedure uses electrodes to apply radio frequency energy to ablate or destroy the abnormal cells in the esophagus and eventually that lining will uh, slough off and will be replaced again by the normal cells. Then um, we have the cryotherapy. Cryotherapy uses extreme cold and thus freezes the abnormal tissue in the esophagus by liquid nitrogen or the carbon dioxide. And also we have the endoscopic mucosal resection aka EMR. EMR is a technique where the endoscope is used to remove the affected esophageal mucosa. So these are the endoscopic therapy most commonly available and in rare cases where the endoscopic therapies are not feasible or not effective, surgical interventions uh, may be considered. Surgical options may include fund duplication where the fundus of the stomach is wrapped around the lower end of the esophagus to tighten the lower esophageal sphincter or esophagectomy to remove the affected portion of the esophagus. So that is all about the Barrett's esophagus. Drop your questions, thoughts and any queries in the comment section below. Do not forget to hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications and join us for more educational contents. Until next time, stay curious, stay inspired and keep those esophagi happy.